On April 9, 2016, a bone-chilling call jolted the Renton Police Department. 911, what are you reporting? This is going to sound really bizarre, but I went to go grab my recycling bin, and there were three white trash bags in the recycling bin, and I went to lift them out. And honestly, it's freaking me out, but it looks like it's a foot. Wrapped in white trash bags were the gruesome remnants of a woman's body. She was 40-year-old Ingrid Line. The findings included a sliced-off leg, a severed arm, and a detached head. As investigators delved deeper, their quest for the missing pieces led them to an individual... Looking into what happened to Ingrid as you're aware she's missing. Yes. And we know that you knew her. What's your relationship with her? What twisted secrets would they uncover in their pursuit of justice? Hello and welcome back to Mysterious 7, where we cover solved, unsolved, and twisted cases from around the world. Today, we'll take a look into the disturbing case of Ingrid Line. But let's start from the beginning. Ingrid Roundsville, a vibrant and cheerful individual, was born on August 2, 1975 in Arizona. After graduating from Canyon del Oro High School in Tucson, Arizona in 1993, she pursued her passion for nursing and obtained a Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree from the University of Arizona in 1997. Ingrid then ventured to Washington in 2000, where she spent around 13 years. She embarked on her nursing career at Seattle's Swedish Medical Center, making a positive impact on people's lives. Ingrid tied the knot with a man named Philip Line, and together they had three beautiful daughters, Reese, Brooke, and Noelle. However, as time went on, their relationship faced difficulties, and Ingrid made the tough decision to divorce Philip in 2014. She bravely moved out of their house and settled in Renton, Washington, along with her three daughters, ready to embark on a new chapter of her life. As a single mother, Ingrid faced challenges in providing for her three beloved daughters. She cherished them deeply and was willing to go to great lengths to ensure their happiness. In 2016, Ingrid was living in Renton with Reese, Brooke, and Noel, who were six, eight, and ten years old at the time. Despite their divorce, Ingrid and Philip maintained contact as they wanted to give their daughters the love of both parents. However, the divorce took a toll on Ingrid, leaving her feeling broken and longing for someone to share her tears with someone who would truly love and respect her, which she'd missed in her previous marriage. It was during this difficult time that 40-year-old Ingrid met a person online through a dating site. Their conversations brought her solace, making her forget about her pain and giving her a sense of love. This person made her feel beautiful and embraced her, along with the fact that she already had three daughters. It was like a dream come true for Ingrid, marking the beginning of a new chapter in her life. On April 8, 2016, after a month of talking online, Ingrid took a leap of faith and agreed to go on a date with a man she'd met online. It was her way of embracing the possibility of moving forward in life. She left her daughters at her ex-husband's house and promised them that she'd take them out the next day. Ingrid and her date chose to attend the opening game of the Seattle Mariners, a thrilling baseball event. Following the game, they headed to a bar where the man's sister happened to work. They spent the evening joyfully playing darts, sharing drinks, and laughing together. Ingrid felt an overwhelming sense of happiness and liberation. Little did she know that this night would leave a lasting impact, not just on her own life, but also on the lives of her daughters and everyone connected to her. The next day, on April 9, 2016, Philip, Ingrid's ex-husband, arrived at her home around 10 a.m. in Renton to drop off their daughters. As he approached the house, he couldn't help but notice that Ingrid's 2015 silver Toyota Highlander was nowhere to be seen. Concerned, he knocked on the door repeatedly, but there was no response. He tried calling her multiple times, but Ingrid didn't answer any of his calls. This was strange because Ingrid was known for never breaking promises, especially when it came to her daughters. Philip couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. Growing increasingly worried, Philip decided to reach out to Ingrid's mother, Jorga Bass, hoping she might have some information about Ingrid's whereabouts. However, after Jorga heard that Ingrid was not at home, she also grew worried because she was just as clueless as Philip and had no idea where Ingrid could be. Filled with anxiety, Jorga hurried to Ingrid's house as she had a spare key. She used it to enter the house and called out for Ingrid, but there was no response. Concerned, Jorga made her way upstairs to check Ingrid's bedroom, 
but Ingrid wasn't there. However, she did find Ingrid's purse and phone on the table, but there was no sign of Ingrid and her car. The situation seemed strange and suspicious. If Ingrid had indeed left the house, it didn't make sense for her phone and purse to be left behind. After all, most people wouldn't leave their homes without money or a way to communicate. This raised even more questions and concerns about Ingrid's whereabouts. Without wasting any time, Yorga called the police and reported her missing. Reporting. The missing person out of our city, so Line is her last name. Mm -hmm. Her name, Ingrid, she and her vehicle are missing. And what kind of car? A silver 2015 Toyota Highlander. And do we have any ideas of where she might be going or? No, uh, her ex-husband was dropping the kids off mm -hmm. and she wasn't there. As the police from the Renton Police Department arrived at Ingrid's house in Renton, they were greeted by Yorga, whose tear-filled eyes revealed her anguish. Initially, the police tried to calm Yorga down, suggesting that Ingrid might have gone out and would return soon. However, Yorga's intuition told her otherwise. She knew something was amiss. Determined to find her daughter, she pleaded with the police to conduct a thorough investigation. The police wasted no time and embarked on a door-to-door -door inquiry, questioning the neighbors in search of any clues. The police diligently questioned the neighbors, asking if they'd seen Ingrid entering her house last night or leaving in the morning. One neighbor had an intriguing account to share. He revealed that he'd seen Ingrid returning home with an unfamiliar man the previous night. The man seemed suspicious, as the neighbor had never seen him before. What puzzled everyone was the fact that no one had witnessed Ingrid leave her house after that. The question lingered, who was this man? And if Ingrid came home but wasn't seen leaving, where could she be? The police urged people to reflect on any unusual occurrences they may have noticed the night before or that morning. They encouraged anyone with information to come forward, as it could be vital in finding Ingrid. The daughters grew increasingly worried when they saw the police asking about their mother. They turned to Yorga, their grandmother, seeking answers. They asked if something happened to their mother, but Yorga reassured them, saying that she'd simply gone somewhere and would return soon. The police promised Yorga that they would look into the matter. Yorga anxiously waited for her daughter to come back home, and suddenly a thought struck her mind. Yorga had a realization that she and Ingrid shared a Verizon account. A Verizon account is a personal or business account that allows you to access and manage various services provided by Verizon, such as phone plans and internet. Curious to find any clues, she checked the phone records and discovered a recurring phone number. Ingrid had received numerous calls from this number, even on the day she went missing. Yorga decided to investigate further and entered the number into Facebook. To her surprise, a profile of a man named John Charlton appeared. With hope in her heart, she reached out to him through a text message, desperately seeking any information about Ingrid's whereabouts. The reply came swiftly. My name is John. I thought she was with her kids today. Yorga quickly replied to John, her fingers trembling as she typed. When did you last see her? She was not here. Her phone, driver's license, and purse were all here, but she's gone. I've called 911 for help. John's response was filled with confusion. 911? What happened? He explained further. We went to the Mariners game last night, but we didn't spend the night together because she had to meet her kids today. I'm not sure what she told you about me and our relationship. Fear gripped Yorga as she typed back. She's missing. Can you please tell me the time you last saw her? The police needed to speak with you as you could be the last person who saw her. At that moment, it became clear to Yorga that Ingrid had indeed gone on a date with John Charlton the previous night. It seemed likely that he was the same man the neighbor had seen returning with Ingrid to her house. With a mix of worry and hope, Yorga realized that John might have some information about Ingrid's whereabouts. But John remained silent, leaving Yorga anxious and desperate for answers. She continued her texts, pleading with him. Please, John, can you call me? I know your name is John Charlton, so please reach out to me. With each passing moment, the weight of uncertainty grew heavier. Yorga couldn't bear the thought of her daughter vanishing without a trace. She pressed on, hoping for any lead, and again texted him. John, did Ingrid mention anything about meeting someone after you parted ways last night? We can't find her or her car. Her phone, ID, and purse are at home, but she and her car have disappeared. We are at our wit's end desperate for any help. Ingrid would never just abandon her family like this. 
However, John remained silent and didn't respond to any of the texts. Yorga felt a sense of helplessness, and tears streamed down her face. The situation intensified when, six hours after Ingrid was reported missing, around 4 p.m., the police received a chilling call from a man named Mike Novasio. 911, what are you reporting? This is going to sound really bizarre, but I went to go grab my recycling bin, and there were three white trash bags in the recycling bin, and I went to lift them out. And honestly, it's freaking me out, but it looks like it's a foot. Mike lived approximately 10 miles away from Ingrid's house at 21st Avenue and East Rhine Street in Seattle. In a frightened voice, he relayed that while taking out his recycling bin, he discovered what appeared to be human body parts contained in white trash bags. Mike's voice trembled as he recounted his unsettling encounter. He described seeing a head and noticing the painted toenails, causing a wave of sickness to wash over him. The sight was too much to bear. He explained that the body parts had been expertly wrapped in the bags, indicating a disturbing level of precision. The police wasted no time and swiftly arrived at the scene. With careful precision, they retrieved the bags from the bins. As the bags were opened, an eerie shock fell upon them. They discovered a severed head, a portion of a leg, and an arm, while the rest of the body parts were missing. With the lack of decomposition, the facial features were intact and distinctive, which indicated that the person had been recently killed. Upon closer examination, the police identified the head as belonging to Ingrid, the woman who'd been reported missing earlier that day. The police were left wondering why the killer had chosen to dump the body parts only 10 miles away in a recycling bin, where they could easily be discovered. Perhaps it was a mocking gesture or a challenge to the police. Or maybe the killer wanted the body parts to be found quickly. They sent the body parts for testing to see if they could provide some clue about the killer. The task of delivering the devastating news to Ingrid's family was difficult for the police. They informed Yorga about the death of Ingrid and about her dismembered body parts that had been found. The news shattered Yorga, leaving her in a state of disbelief and questioning why anyone would inflict such cruelty on her daughter. The realization that her granddaughters would no longer experience Ingrid's love and presence was heartbreaking. Meanwhile, the police intensified their search for the missing parts. The following day, on April 10th, 2016, Yorga logged into Facebook, hoping for a response from John in light of Ingrid's tragic demise. Yet, there was still no reply. She waited till afternoon, and finally, she contacted the police and provided them with all the details about John and his connection to Ingrid. The police understood that if John was the last person who saw Ingrid, he could provide some insight into the case. They made several attempts to reach him, but received no response until the evening when John finally answered their call. Recognizing the importance of speaking with them and making sure he didn't try to run away from the interrogation, the police used a ruse, claiming they needed to discuss Ingrid's ongoing disappearance and that they were closely monitoring his activities. They warned him that if he failed to cooperate with them, then that would result in his arrest. Consequently, the next day, on April 11th, 2016, John arrived at the police department for questioning. First, the police carefully checked him to ensure that he didn't have any hidden weapons with him. Do you have anything hidden in your socks or shoes? Yeah. Then the interrogation began, and the police asked him about his place of residence. And what is an address for you, John? I'm homeless. Are you? Where are you staying right now? On the street. The police further questioned him about Ingrid. It we're looking into what happened to Ingrid as you're aware she's missing. Yes. And we know that you knew her. What's your relationship with her? Have you been dating her consistently since you met or? I would say, I guess, yeah. The police delved deeper into their relationship, seeking to understand its dynamics and uncover the potential motives that could have led John to harm her. Did she let you stay at her place or did she, were you staying elsewhere? She let me stay there sometimes. How often were you guys seeing one another, like with the last couple weeks? Surprisingly, as they observed his facial expressions, they couldn't help but notice his unusual calmness, despite the fact that his girlfriend was murdered. They questioned John about the day Ingrid was last seen, which was April 8, 2016. What's the last memory you have of contact with Ingrid? Like, what's the last memory you remember? Do you remember her driving you downtown? I believe I sent her a message that morning. I knew she had her kids the next day, so that wasn't good. She didn't want me to meet her kids, ever. I don't know about ever, but 
Their goal was to gather every possible detail about that day, wanting a comprehensive account of the events. So when you were back in her place and you had sex, and I apologize for asking this, but was it in the, was it in the, was it in the bedroom or somewhere else? I think we did. You think you did? You don't remember it? I don't. I mean, usually, yeah, I'm just assuming that we did. As the questioning came to an end, the police exited the room, but the cameras continued to capture John's actions. Strangely, the cameras caught him rolling up his sweatshirt to use as a makeshift pillow, seemingly unfazed by the gravity of the situation. John's responses during the questioning were indeed peculiar. But the testing on Ingrid's body parts was still going on, and there wasn't any such evidence which could link John to Ingrid's murder. As a result, they had no choice but to release him, but they made sure to keep a close watch on his activities, hoping to uncover any new leads. In a matter of just a few days, the disappearance case had taken a grim turn, evolving into a full-fledged murder investigation. Determined to uncover the truth, the police obtained a search warrant for Ingrid's house. Inside, their search led them to a startling discovery. An almost empty box of garbage bags, similar to the ones found in the recycling bin. They combed through every nook and cranny, carefully examining the premises. To their horror, they stumbled upon a pruning saw, ominously propped up in the bathroom. Upon closer inspection, the saw's teeth revealed traces of blood, tissue, and bone. Adding to the chilling evidence, they also found blood in the bathtub drain. It appeared that Ingrid had been dismembered in her own bathroom with the pruning saw after her untimely demise. It became really important for them to find the remaining body parts soon. On April 15, 2016, the police received a call from a man named Michael Mullen who'd made a chilling discovery in his recycling bin. As he went through the bin that morning, he stumbled upon a wrapped package that turned out to be a torso with a pierced belly button. The police quickly responded to the call and reached 20th Avenue between East Union and Marion Streets, Seattle, and they were alarmed because Ingrid also had a pierced belly button and her previous body parts were found in similar garbage bags. They confirmed that the torso was hers. After sending the previously found body parts for testing, another significant discovery was made on April 18, 2016. A human leg was found at a recycling plant in South Hanford Street, Seattle. The leg belonged to a woman that had the same painted toenails as Ingrid. This meant that Ingrid's body parts had been scattered across three different locations, including the recycling bins where they were easily found. The police began to suspect that the perpetrator might not be a serial killer, as they typically dispose of bodies in places where they can't easily be recovered. Instead, they started considering the possibility that the culprit could be someone close to Ingrid. The police, determined to uncover any overlooked evidence, returned to Ingrid's home. They decided to remove the plumbing and conduct a thorough examination. To their surprise, they discovered more blood in the dismantled drain trap. To enhance their investigation, they utilized a regent called Blue Star, which further revealed traces of blood that had been carefully cleaned up. It became evident that this was no impulsive act of violence. It was a well-planned and executed murder, adding an intriguing twist to the case. As the reports from the testing arrived, more disturbing details about Ingrid's death came to light. Initially, her death was classified as homicidal violence, but upon closer examination by the medical examiner, they discovered petechia, tiny blood vessels in her eyes that indicated she'd been strangled. Additionally, there was evidence of hemorrhaging on the neck. It became evident that Ingrid had first been strangled and then dismembered inside her own home. It revealed the manner in which Ingrid's life was taken suggesting a deep-seated hatred towards her. The toxicology report revealed that Ingrid had no drugs in her system, but her blood alcohol level, BAC, was 0.074, slightly higher than the normal range. Two days later, on April 20th, 2016, the police discovered Ingrid's car in Belltown, a short six-minute drive from Seattle. This raised suspicion because John claimed that Ingrid had dropped him off downtown and would have returned home before her murder. It seemed odd that her car was abandoned so close to Seattle, where they'd attended the Seattle Mariners game together. The police carefully searched the entire car and made a chilling discovery. The same white trash bags that had contained Ingrid's dismembered body parts were found inside the vehicle. In addition, the police discovered three fingerprints on the driver's door handle of the car. These prints were crucial, as they could belong to Ingrid since the car belonged to her, or 
they could belong to the killer who'd driven her car to that location. Recognizing the importance of this evidence, the fingerprints were promptly sent for testing. The results confirm the police's suspicions. The fingerprints match those of John Charlton, the man Ingrid had gone on a date with on the night she disappeared. It became evident that John's statements during the interrogation were all deceptive tactics to misguide the police. Despite initially claiming to be drunk and unaware of what happened that night, the planning and execution of the crime, along with the thorough cleaning of the house to erase any traces of evidence, indicated that John acted with full awareness and had a clear motive behind killing Ingrid. Police remembered that during the interrogation, John had said that he used to stay with his ex-girlfriend. In their quest for more information about John, the police made significant efforts to locate and interview his ex-girlfriend, ensuring her identity remained undisclosed for privacy reasons. During the interview, she revealed that John, who worked as a day laborer, would usually spend his nights at a shelter in Seattle, except for a couple of nights each week when he stayed at her place. They'd known each other for about a year, and she allowed him to keep some of his belongings at her residence. Interestingly, she mentioned to the police that John was supposed to visit her on the Saturday morning of April 9, 2016, the day after his date with Ingrid. However, he arrived later than planned, claiming that something had come up. She revealed that he arrived at the bus station in Lake Stevens around 10.30 p.m., and she immediately noticed that he had a swollen and injured lip. When questioned about it, John claimed that someone had tried to rob him at a bar, even though he still had his wallet. This detail caught the attention of the police. When they questioned John on April 11, 2016, they observed abrasions on his head, chin, and scratches on his chest and arms. These injuries seemed to align with the disturbing possibility. They could have been inflicted during the struggle between John and Ingrid when he strangled her. It appeared that she'd fought back bravely, leaving her mark on him in a desperate attempt to save herself. Without hesitation, the police swiftly took action, arresting John and charging him with the murder of Ingrid Lyne. John Robert Charlton was born in 1979 in Washington to his parents Ray and Joanne Charlton. At 37 years old, he had a history of run-ins with the law. His past included a misdemeanor assault conviction in King County in 1997, indicating a tendency towards aggression. In addition, he had a record of negligent driving in Washington State back in 1998. In 2006, he was charged with attempted aggravated robbery in Utah. It seemed like he was no stranger to trouble. In 2008, he was convicted of felony theft in Montana. Furthermore, records showed a misdemeanor battery case in Idaho in 2009, suggesting a pattern of violent behavior. These previous encounters with the law added a layer of complexity to John's character and raised concerns about his potential involvement in serious crimes. John's troubled past extended beyond his criminal record. Disturbing incidents involving his parents shed light on his volatile behavior. In 2006, John's parents, Ray and Joanne Charlton, sought protection against him, citing concerns for their safety. They described his drunken outbursts and expressed fear for their well-being. Court records revealed an unsettling encounter on March 2, 2006, when John, under the influence of alcohol, became physically and verbally abusive towards his parents. During that time, Ray alleged that John removed the movie Hannibal from a shelf in the house and set it in front of his wife and told her she would watch that and beware. According to his parents, John harbored grudges for years and his behavior became increasingly intimidating and violent when under the influence of alcohol or drugs. They also suspected his usage of crack cocaine. Although the petition for the protection order was ultimately dismissed, these incidents painted a troubling picture of John's unstable and aggressive tendencies. Despite initially denying any knowledge of Ingrid's fate, John eventually changed his plea to guilty before the trial commenced. The courtroom was gripped by the prosecution's case, alleging that John murdered Ingrid inside her own home. Mr. Charlton intentionally and with premeditation strangled Ingrid to death. He placed her body in a bathtub using a pruning saw. He dismembered her body, severing her limbs and head from her torso. To everyone's horror, it was then detailed how John drove through downtown Seattle, disposing of Ingrid's body parts in different trash cans. The medical examiner's report confirmed that Ingrid's death was the result of homicidal violence. In response, the defense team argued that there was a lack of forensic evidence connecting anyone, including their client, 
to Ingrid's murder. They pleaded with the community not to hastily jump to conclusions during this tragic event. Every piece of evidence seemed to point towards John's involvement. The prosecutor, Dan Satterberg, acknowledged that there were still unanswered questions. The motive behind Ingrid's murder may never be fully understood. However, he commended the diligent work of the police and prosecutors who painstakingly gathered evidence to build a strong case against the person they believed was responsible for her death. It was a challenging task, but their dedication paid off in bringing justice to Ingrid. John received a maximum prison sentence of 27 years and 9 months based on the state's guidelines. However, Judge Julie Spector, presiding over the case in King County Superior Court, expressed her strong condemnation, stating that if she had the power, she would have given him a life sentence. She described his actions as vicious and cruel, beyond anyone's imagination. During the sentencing hearing, John addressed the court and Ingrid's grieving family, acknowledging the immense pain he caused and expressing genuine remorse. I do agree that there are no words that can... There's no words that can alleviate the pain that I've caused. And for that, I'm truly sorry. Ingrid's ex-husband, Philip Line, expressed the profound loss caused by John's actions, describing how John had stolen not only his co-parent and someone to share thoughts with, but also a loving and caring mother to their daughters. Philip lamented that they would no longer have Ingrid's motherly advice, miss out on cherished traditions like July 4th holidays in Big Fork, Montana, beach trips and Thursday night dinners at a steakhouse. He further shared the heartbreaking reality that their children's future children would never know the love of a maternal grandmother. Despite their resilience, Philip acknowledged that their daughters deeply feel the absence of their mother every single day. Our daughters continue to thrive, but miss their mother every day in different ways. Ingrid's friend, Nancy Civitilli, expressed the indescribable horror that engulfed everyone upon learning about Ingrid's tragic death. She emphasized that the murder went beyond a simple act of violence. Her body was violated, leaving an unimaginable aftermath. Civitilli didn't mince words in calling John a coward. Civitilli directed her words directly at John, reminding him of the profound impact his actions had on Ingrid's daughters, as he selfishly tore away a beautiful person and a devoted mother from their lives. She further highlighted the loss felt by friends like herself who cherished Ingrid like a sister. While justice has been served, the scars of this tragedy remain. Let this case serve as a reminder of the importance of vigilance, empathy, and the pursuit of justice for those whose lives have been stolen. What are your thoughts on this case? What could be the reason for John to kill Ingrid in such a horrific manner? We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.